You're listening to The Startup Artist, where acclaimed filmmaker Kurt John Mungle shows you how to hack your psychology, get connected, and finally make money with your art. I'm here with Carol Dean of the Roy Dean Film Grant. She's going to correct me if I said any of that incorrectly. And we're going to talk all about how do you maximize the chances of you getting a grant in general and then what her grant is about for filmmakers and artists. Because I think, as far as I know, that her grant doesn't just apply to filmmaking. So, Carol, how are you? Very good, thank you. So, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this. Well, a long time ago, once upon a time, the only way you could make a film was with uh, 35 or 16 millimeter raw stuff. And I watched, uh, I was on the set a lot, and I watched how they would reload a camera. They'd take a thousand foot roll, put it on, then they'd pull the roll off, and they would bring back a new roll. And I said, what are they doing with those little old short pieces of film? I called them short ends, and they said, oh, no one would ever buy film that didn't come direct from Kodak. And I just had a hunch that I could do that, that I could buy stock left over from major productions, buy from the studios and sell it to the independents because there was a crisis happening in Hollywood in the early 70s. It was, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Because there are independent filmmakers out there now. Well, I thought they would be a great market and they were. So uh, my husband was an Irish guy and he was very frugal. And he said, look, just take $20 from the house money and see what you can do. And I built a very big business on that $20. I started buying raw stock and reselling it. Uh, and it was perfect. Uh, I sold to people like Corman, Cassavetes even bought from me. A lot of the filmmakers that are uh, documentary filmmakers today bought stock from us, 16 millimeter, and some of the top directors of photography today started with our short ends. So it was a very lucrative business. I ran it for 33 years and then I sold it. And uh, that was in 2001. So you identified a market opportunity and then you went for it. That sounds entrepreneurial. So was, oh, I, was that always in you, that entrepreneurial drive or did you have to cultivate yeah, that? I think it was. Um, I've always loved to work. Uh, you know, I had my first job when I was 16 and uh, I've always had, uh, I love business. I love uh, what I do. So, and I love selling. That's part of life, really. You have to, you're always selling yourself. So uh, to have a business and deal with filmmakers was a lot of fun for me because filmmakers are so talented and they're brilliant to be around and work with. Did you not encounter competition from buying the raw film stock? Because as soon as your business starts to be a little bit successful, oh, yes. then the company should notice and then they should start doing the same thing. Exactly what happened. Uh, I had my maybe two or three years, I was the only one buying and selling. And then a competitor called me and he said, oh, I'm just starting to do the same thing you're doing in New York. And, uh, so I said, fine. Well, um, he said, let me, I'd, maybe we can buy and sell to each other. I said, terrific. So what we did was that I made a sale to him of 16 millimeter film, a large amount that I had just bought. I gave him a price. I remember it was three cents a foot. And he said, okay. Uh, and, and in that world at that time, your voice, your, we made deals on the phone. I made a deal. I sold him. He agreed to buy it. I said, uh, I will ship it to you, send the money. And that's how we did business. This is before there was video calls? Oh, yeah. Before any of this, it was our word was your bond. So I didn't get I didn't get the check. I didn't hear from him. I called him back a couple of weeks later and said, uh, what's happening? And he said, oh, he said, no, I'm, uh, I'm not going to pay you that price. I want it lower. And I've been sitting on the stock because a deal's a deal. And I, I said, my gosh, I could have sold this two or three times here in LA. So I said, okay, I, I don't think we can do business together. I hung up the phone and I had Did one- Did you say it like that? Like so politely? I don't think we can do business together, hang up the phone? Because you sound like a sweet old woman, a sweet woman, but I'm sure that- No, I was 
really could There's something under the surface there. <laughs> but nevertheless, I was on a plane the next day to New York, and I decided to heck with it. I'll buy, I, I will start my own business in New York, and that's how I did. I started it. And I knew two people. And they took me around and introduced me to everybody in New York. I mean, it was a, a great time. The Italians were running the uh, laboratories and uh, they liked me and took good care of me. And the filmmakers were all there. So uh, I rented a little house or, or condo and uh, on 46th Street, right in the middle of the heart of the film district. And the guys would all come by and we would just sit and chat. We'd be sitting on cases of 35 millimeter film because I didn't have the money for furniture in the beginning. But it became a very lucrative business for me. And so was the LA office. And then I opened Chicago. Uh, but the uh, business expanded and people started doing the same thing. So competition set in and it cut into uh, the profits. So I just expanded laterally and I took on uh, Fuji Film and Maxell distributors for film. And then I expanded into um, recycling. It became the largest recycler in the United States, the videotape. And how did the Roy Dean grant come about from that or is it unrelated? Okay, well, you see, early on, my father lived in Dallas, mother and dad, and they were retired. And so I let them start a, a company there in Dallas to buy and sell film stock because I wanted dad to have something to do. He had just retired. And they had a lot of fun with working with filmmakers. So I said, why don't you move to California and help me? And they did. So dad could have any job in the business, but he loved working with filmmakers over the counter. So he would stand up all day talking to filmmakers and they wouldn't, they loved him so much, Kurt, they wouldn't let anybody else wait on him. And he would spend as much time with a 100 foot reel of 16 millimeter sail as he did with the 50,000 feet of 35. And um, so when dad, uh, one day, I'll tell you this story. It's one of my favorite Roy Dean stories. I was going through the accounts receivable, and they were all the big companies in Hollywood that we sold to. And I found this Jama Fanaka, and there was $10,000. What's of Jama the, Fanaka? One of the top uh, filmmakers in Hollywood back in the 70s. He had just graduated from UC, UCLA, I think. Well, he was brilliant, and he had convinced my father to give him stock on credit. Now, we nobody did that, but uh, Dad did. So Dad actually financed the first African, all African-American film called Penitentiary in the early 70s. And Jama was really smart. He didn't have a lot of money. He, he had the actors. He had the script. So he got the raw stock from dad and he went to Fox, gave him, gave them the uh, film for processing. Then he told them, I don't have the money to pay for it. And they said, OK, well, we're going to give you an editing room and you edit and sell this film and then you can pay us. And we'll because we're not going to let it out of here. And he did just that. And he came back. Of course, he paid me and said, um, I said, what are you going to do with all that money, John? He said, I'm going to buy Rolls Royce, Silver Cloud, and I'm going to call it Roy. Because without Roy, I wouldn't have been able to make this film. So it was a wonderful uh, way that he got started. And he went on to make Penitentiary 2 and some other incredible movies. He was nice. So now why don't you tell us specifically what does the Roy Dean grant do now? What funding does it provide? And also fix your camera a little bit so that we can see all of you. Okay, thank you. Well, um, what does it provide? Well, we have, I'm trying to get a little of everything that you have to spend money for when you're producing. Uh, from titles at the end to uh, lighting to cameras, uh, to editing, to post, to sound color correction, all of those are people I know in the industry. Because I'll just go back and say that when uh, when dad died, I was running, still running uh, my business. And 
I realized that Jama wasn't the only one he gave money to. He'd given money and films to a lot of people so that he was doing a lot of good. And I, so when he crossed over is when I put something in Variety saying that dad was on the other side and the phone calls started coming in saying I would never have uh, gotten my job. Mm -hmm. I have a good job in the film industry. It's because Roy gave me the raw stock to make my uh, short film. So I got this job or I graduated from college because of Roy. So that's when I started the film grant. And uh, that was 1992. So it's 26 years old now. And I knew a lot of people in the industry because I was in that industry every day. So I started raising goods and services, and then I gave the Rostock. So when Rost, as Rostock went away, I started giving videotape, and then now I give cash as well as goods and services. So the whole package is usually around 20, 25,000, depending. Per filmmaker or in total yes. per year? No, for a filmmaker. That's what they get in total. And how many filmmakers are you able to give this funding to per year? Three, three a year. We do a spring grant, a summer grant, and a fall grant. Sorry, it's cut off. So how many filmmakers per year? You said you do a spring grant, a summer grant, and a fall grant. And how yes. many filmmakers in each? Three filmmakers a year. Three, right? okay. Grant. Well, I see, I see. Is we have, we choose the top 20, and then we choose another 20 that we feel are hot films in the making. And all of those films go into uh, our website so that we help promote them during the uh, year okay. so they can get public relations and use us as their marketing tool. So while they can't necessarily get funds because they weren't the top film, they can at least get something in the form of extra promotion by legitimizing themselves with Yeah, because that's website. what it's all about. This is a marketing game. It's Hollywood is not a filmmaking place. It's right. a film marketing town. Yeah. You and you mainly help out indies, indie filmmakers? Sorry? And you said you mainly help out indie filmmakers? Yes. Yes. Okay. And is it only in the States or is it worldwide? No, it's worldwide. We've had a winner in uh, Canada and Australia. And uh, we get a lot of entries from England and uh, all over Europe and Africa. So what types of films are you looking for? Well, we want films that are unique and make a contribution to society. So examples of films that we uh, have won the grant are Stranger at Home, the story of, of veterans coming home with PTSD. Restoring Balance is about uh, autistic children being bringing them back into consciousness uh, mm -hmm. into the now with diet. Uh, Sands That's of interesting. Sex trafficking. Uh, Do No Harm was about uh, doctors committing suicide, a high rate. It's unpublished here in America because of the uh, horrors that they put them through in their training and their schooling. So we like films that are even, uh, we've done films about ballerinas and cowboys. Those all sound like documentaries. Do you do any narrative ones? Any ones that are just fictional? Yes, we have. <clears throat> we sponsor, you know, through our sponsorship, uh, La Junta de Oro was one of our best films. And that was uh, the winner of 88 awards around the world. Uh, it's a, a Mexican film. And uh, Diego is the gentleman who made the film. It's the most awarded film ever made in Mexico. Um, and we've supported um, a documentary uh, that is being shown on HBO called I Am Evidence mm. and other features. So what other types of projects do you fund? I remember that you're not just for filmmaking, or I could be wrong. Um, no, it is webisodes, shorts, features, and docs. Those are the things that we fund. Okay, and what mistakes do you see when filmmakers apply? What do they make? What, what mistakes do they make? Well, uh, usually they forget uh, the, what we consider the most important thing, and that is marketing. Who is your market? How will you reach them? 
And are you engaging them now? And are you working with them? Uh, because in today's world, you really need to identify, uh, attach, entertain, and take care of your own audience because you're going to have to take it with you when you go to VOD. They're going to want all those names, and you will too, because that's where you're going to get your money back. So how do they get? How do they articulate to you their market when most filmmakers have no influence at all, and they're just trying to get their friends to watch their films. Right. Well, the most, uh, I wrote something, Paul, and you can Google this. It's called How to Mine, M-I-N-E, Your Audience for Gold. Okay, we're going to include that link in the YouTube yeah. description below, just in case anyone wants a quick path to that URL. All right, because um, the idea is that you take your um current audience and you ask them a series of questions and I've outlined all the questions for you so that you can find out where they hang out online, how they watch films, on what device, that'll tell you how much money you have to put into a camera and um, what they're, where they hang out is one of the most important things you want to find out because that's where you would need to go to find more of your existing audience. Now, this audience, you don't talk to your family and friends. You go to people that you don't know who really like your film. And then you can really get a good profile on your audience. And then the market. What is your market? Um, because niche audiences can be very beneficial and financially rewarding. Identifying those and going after them is a key for you and your film. What so other misconceptions, right sorry, what other mistakes do you see? Do you see any other types of mistakes besides the lack of a marketing effort or lack of knowledge that the marketing effort is important? Yes, it's more a lack of knowledge. And uh, well, also, they don't seem to be aware of some of the newer forms of distribution that we have. Cinema on demand can be excellent for a lot of people. So I recommend Tug and... Uh, they now have an educational division that's quite good, too. The, the other side of it is that you are storytellers. Filmmakers are storytellers. And they get so intent on explaining to you the history sometimes or why this film should be made that they, they get away from the story. And actually, that's all we're looking for is tell me a story. What are the three things I want? Story, story, story. And when you do, then I can, and if you tell me with the proper adjectives to give me a vision of your film, a written vision, then I'm with you. I can track you and see the film. And that's how you really get funded. What did some filmmaker do that you loved when they were applying? Well, um, they in, for, first of all, they read my book, The Art of Film Funding, second edition. And in there it says, before you apply for a grant, you need to read everything on their website, figure out what question you can ask that they haven't already answered, and then make a phone call and introduce yourself to the granting person. Make sure that you thank them for a film or more films that they have uh, put through the grant and then give them your short pitch, no longer than two minutes, and ask them a question that is not on the website. So maybe something like, how many grant applications did you have on your last funding round? Because you have to make a connection with this person. You need a true one-on-one -on -one connection. And uh, you are to get off the phone quick. Don't pitch them forever. But say, yes, thank you very much. I will be applying for your grant. Now, when you hang up the phone, you write a card, a thank you card, and you pitch them again. I'm Carol Dean with my film so-and-so, and I will be applying. Thank you for the information you gave me. So now you've touched this person twice. So when they get your application, it's not that they're going 
to put you in the winner's pile, but they have a co connection to you. They Hopefully, they know your passion for the film, because passion is what we look for. That's something that has to jump off the page at me. So in other words, it's something like you need to stand out as a filmmaker positively, not just in a horrible sense. And one of the ways of standing out positively is to read up on your grant, the one that you're going to apply to, and find an insightful question that they haven't answered so that it looks like you've done your research, not looks like, so that it shows, demonstrates that you have done your research. And yeah. then when you're asking them that question, that's your chance to build some rapport. And you can also quickly pitch your project just so that they know about it, not so that they can say yes to it on the phone because they're not going to, and you're going to look sleazy if you do that. And then as soon as you hang up, well, cool, they have you a little bit at the back of their mind, but then you write that thank you card written and you send that. So then they definitely have you at the at, in their mind. And then when you submit your grant, then that's three points of contact. So they will for sure remember you. So at least you will stand out. Yes. Okay. And, and I'll tell you another thing that filmmakers do. They keep me updated, all right? And I love it. I don't know about other grantors, but I like it when you say, okay, it's three months since I talked to you and I want you to know I've attached this person or I've done that or this wonderful thing happened. I have the greatest DP in the world uh, because I know you're moving forward. And I like to hear that. You may not always get an email back from me, but you know I got it. And I am paying attention to your film because a lot of times it's the second or the third time you apply that you will win the grant. Now this works when you get to talk to the grant giver one-on-one, -on -one, but what about these agencies that are so large that they have gatekeepers and you can't, you can't even talk to the people who are going to be judging the applications? I think you can get through to most people. I really do. Because most of the time, the people giving the grants are not filmmakers. We're, we're either educators or we are teachers or we just love working with filmmakers because you are so creative that uh, we admire you and respect you. And it's wonderful to be on the phone and hear your project, as long as it is a good, short, concise pitch with a lot of passion. So what other pieces of advice do you have for film sponsorship now? Let's talk about film sponsorship. Well, uh, being physically sponsored in America uh, allows your donors to get a tax deduction, which we all love to have. And it also uh, lets your donors know that they're writing the check to the nonprofit who then gives you the money. And once a year, you report back to the nonprofit how you spent that money. So that if they're, uh, if donors uh, want to know how the money was spent, they come back to us and say, you know, I gave her $500. How did she use that money? And we look at your report and we tell them the money went to this or pay for a cameraman or whatever. So they feel that you're being monitored. And of course, we have no ownership in the film and we don't tell you what to do. We're just here to help you through education, enlightenment. When you're when you hit the wall, you've got to have somebody to talk to sometimes and maybe your pitch isn't working and you have to rework it or your paperwork uh, is not strong enough and you've got to have some feedback and that's really what sponsorships do. It seems like you're extremely passionate about working with filmmakers. Yes. <laughs> Was, so did that just start from when you were selling these stock films? Well, you see, I just find that filmmakers are some of the most creative people in the world. I talk to people every day who are writers, directors, producers. I mean, can you imagine all that talent in one person? It's, it's incredible. So um, I find that this is a wonderful way to spend my life, being in contact with filmmakers. Actually, um, my vice president went to a board meeting in LA where all the other fiscal sponsors were there and they were sharing ideas and problems that occur in, in running this type of a business. And so they said, well, what are you doing new? And he said, oh, well, we're giving a film funding class every two weeks and Carol Dean does it. And they all gasped and said, how do you have the time? Well, I think that's what it's we're here for, to teach you how to fund. 
How do you put any of those online? Any of your classes online? Um, some, yes. If you go online on the website, they're um, under resources. I think the second or third drop down, you'll find what's really important is how to set goals and how to decide what your purpose is as a filmmaker, because you really need that. I find when you're pitching someone, see, you're talking about the film, but we're we're analyzing you. It's who are you? Have you so it's uh, more about you. It's more about the filmmaker than the film. I feel the same way. So at Indie Film TO, we have an, an incubator, a film incubator. It's almost like a funding agency, except except it's more about shaping a film to be marketable as well as shaping the filmmaker and we always we have this phrase which is that we care more about the filmmaker than the film and that sounds cliche in a sense but it means that i don't care about this particular film being successful i care about your trajectory in life being successful and how does this film relate to your next film yes this is what i'm so proud of we're not making films we're making filmmakers that's what we do here right and that's what it's all about. So we do this class on every two weeks for our filmmakers. But one of the main things we talk about is how to use your mind to create your future. That's my passion. Is this something like the law of attraction? Well, it's deeper than that. I think the law of attraction was great in opening people's eyes. But I like to teach Wallace Waddles, who was in 19... 19- Five, and he wrote about how to use your mind to create your future. And then Stuart Wilde, or Brett, he had some great ideas. Uh, and uh, Neville Goddard, I like him. So I take their information, put it together into teaching and lessons for filmmakers, because if you don't have the faith in yourself and your film, you're not going to do good out there raising money. It's you we're giving the money to, not the film. You know, this sounds so so much, this sounds so similar to what we do too, because we focus probably 80% on the psychology of filmmaking, the psychology of the filmmaker themselves. How do you overcome limiting beliefs? How do you get motivation when you feel none? How do you pitch? How do you influence yourself to influence others? Because pitching really is almost like a state transference. So if you're passionate, the other person's more likely to be passionate. And how do you make yourself passionate when you're a dry person who talks like this? (laughs) No, no, you have to have all that. And I say, read some sales books. Get the top two best-selling sales books and read them because that's what you are. You are a myriad of things. You're not only a writer, producer, director, Uh, You are a paralegal. You are a salesperson. You have to close people. You have so much to do. You have to market your film, raise the money. Are you kidding? All of these things are required for filmmakers to make their art. Now, some filmmakers hear this and then they say, oh, that sounds like so much on top of what I'm doing already, which is using all of my hours, burning the midnight oil. And now I have to learn the legalities of what I'm doing. Now I have to learn how to pitch and how to get funding. Yes. And other people have teams for this and I'm just an individual or I'm just a person with just three people on my team. So what do you say to that? I say, look at the local college or university and find yourself an intern because they will learn so much from you. And even if you have them go to the grocery store, pick up your cleaning, walk the dog, I don't care what they do every minute that they give you free time for you to work on your film, then the the further you move towards your goals. The other thing is that um, I am highly uh, suggesting that people start giving a social networking credit to anyone who will promise them three hours a week of social networking for a year. That to three hours times 50 weeks, 150 hours, of a month at a job is 160 hours. So in other words, you give me a month of your time broken into three hours a week, and I'll give you a social networking credit for my film. So you're going to get out of college and you've got your first credit. This is what I would do. You've got to have help. And don't use money as an excuse because 
you're very talented and other people will enjoy working with you and learning from you. See it as a benefit to them. In other words, it's never a lack of resources. It's a lack of resourcefulness. Well said. So what else are you passionate about? Well, um, what else am I passionate about? Films, filmmakers, and using your mind to create your future. I think that's the most important thing we all have to do. Where do you see your future in the next few years? Next few years, um, I am creating uh, <clears throat> some teaching. I'm st I started to do like a 30-minute uh, webisode. It's now 90 minutes because there's so much information that you really need to have for, because I'm covering docs, shorts, features, etc. And so I think that's the next thing I want to do is have this as much information as I can put together on funding your film and have it available for filmmakers. They can either buy the big one or they can buy uh, how to do a fundraising house party or how to make an ask, how to market. All those things will be in there. So you're building so, little mini courses on film funding. Yes, that's right. And what last words do you have that are whatever you'd like to promote? Well, it's for you. It's faith funds films. You can't lose faith. Why would you think that the universe would put you right now in the middle of this greatest digital revolution where you don't have to buy raw stock or go through all that processing and all that expense, you can do a film for one-tenth today, and you can use all of your creativity to market and bring in the money. So they wouldn't give you all of that talent, put you here at the perfect time, and not fund you. So you have to think on a daily basis how talented you are and how lucky people are to be able to work with you and to give you money to promote your art and for you to deliver those brilliant documentaries with all that great advice for us. So always remember that you are the greatest. Pat yourself on the back for whatever you achieve today and never put yourself down. You are the best. Thank you so much. I want to echo your sentiment because it seems as though the filmmakers that I encounter have two primary problems and some are overly arrogant in which case they need their they need a they need to hit reality and then the others are are extremely have an underestimation of their abilities and for them it's something like what i say is to realize that money is abundant money is everywhere you can get it from the atm you can ask someone for five dollars and they can give it to you so money is pretty much everywhere what is rare is you and your idea so you actually have the power and you think it's the other person and as soon as you realize that you are the one that has the power in, in a non-arrogant manner in a non-cocky manner in a and actually in a humble manner but knowing your worth then the game changes exactly right exactly right you need to have the attitude I'm making this film with or without you. And if you want to come on board, be part of our team, terrific, because we'd love to have you. But my projection is, my shooting schedule is, and, there, and I'm going on down the road with or without you. This is what has to be in your DNA, because that's when we want to get on board and be part of it. Thank you so much, Carol. I appreciate it so much. And all these filmmakers who are listening, who even if they don't win your grants because you only are allowed to give out three per year. Maybe they get on your website, but either way, they've gotten so many more tips that it'll help them with the rest of their career and with grant writing in general, grant applying in general. Right, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time.